30 minutes. But okay. I'd like to uh, welcome you to our Google Hangout Skype uh, combination. And and like to thank you so much for making the time. What time is it in Mumbai at the moment? It is a little after 10 p.m. A little bit after 10 p.m. Are the kids asleep? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> okay. So so now um, you are a space scientist. Is that correct? That's right. I'm a planetary scientist. So I have a PhD in astronomy um, from the University of Colorado in the United States, and I'm involved with. Uh, a bunch of programs in the solar system, including the New Horizons mission out to Pluto. So now, tell me a bit about this New Horizons thing. I mean, as far as I understand, Pluto is quite far out. Uh, in fact, so far out that literally it takes how long to get there? Well, it takes us nine and a half years to get out to Pluto. Uh, we launched in 2006, in January, and uh, we had uh, nine and a half year trip and to get to Pluto in on July 14th of 2015, and uh, it's about uh, six billion kilometers out there, or 40 AU astronomical units. And uh, nine and a half years seems like a long time, uh, but it's actually pretty quick for getting out to six billion kilometers. This is the fastest spacecraft we've ever sent away from the Earth, and uh, the reason why we're going so fast is it's a little trick of physics. Well, it's not really a trick. If you've taken a physics class, you know what the trick is to get someone to go fast. You build something small, and you put a huge engine on it. So we built the smallest spacecraft we could, and we put the biggest rocket we could buy on it, which is something called a Atlas V from Lockheed Martin. And we launched it, and uh, that's why we're going so fast and why we can do this 6 billion kilometer trip in just nine and a half years. Wow. So, so from what I can understand, um, you had to plan nine and a half, in fact, 10 or 11 years in advance before you could send this thing off. I mean, you, I mean, you, I mean you, you've got to think of the rockets. You've got to think of how this thing is going to travel that it, and, and if there are problems, how do you problem solve from so far away? And then it's got to go, not hit Pluto, but go past Pluto. And since we've never been there, how do you accurately get it to, to go near Pluto? Well, you know, um, uh, <clears throat> navigating through the solar system is not actually as bad as, uh, as it may seem. It's actually quite a bit harder if you're trying to like drive from, say, Pretoria to Cape Town. Uh -huh. You've got to make hundreds and hundreds of turns and dodge some potholes and dodge food in the road and, and, and you know, whatnot. Um, if you're going out to Pluto, you just go in a straight line and you push your rocket there. And it goes. It's essentially like like bowling, where if you if you throw the ball in the right direction and it keeps going, it's going to get there. Um, uh, it's controlled only by the laws of gravity. Uh, if you take if you take in the physics class, you have two equations: F equals m a, which is one of, which is Newton's first law, and the equation of gravity, g m m over r squared. Mm -hmm. And you put those two things together for uh, the couple of masses in the solar system that are large enough, meaning just the planets and the sun. And uh, you can predict exactly uh, in what direction you want to send your spacecraft and exactly when it's going to get there. We did that. Uh, we, we do have some, uh, uh, you know, some ways to measure where our spacecraft is, uh, just from how long it takes to send a signal and, and uh, where we see it in the sky. And after nine and a half years, you know what, Steve? We got there one minute early. Wow. I mean, the elation that you must have felt. I mean, you were there with the New Horizons team up in the U.S., when, when it was about to make its first uh, approach, is that correct? That is its first and only approach on uh, Bastille Day, which is July 14th. Um, and uh, so that was when it both got to Pluto uh, and the day when it took all of its pictures and the day that it left Pluto because it's going so fast that it only had, uh, we had about 12 hours of intense observations there. And then it went past Pluto, went around to the dark side, and once you're to the dark side of Pluto, you can still, still take some pictures, but your uh, uh, most of your picture-taking opportunities are when you're looking at the lit side of Pluto rather than the dark side. And so you take those pictures quickly, and we'd plan out in very precise detail what all we were trying to take pictures of so we could you know, maximize that time because this is uh, close to a billion dollars of, uh, of uh, observations here to, to, uh, to, to look at Pluto, and we want to get the maximum science that we can here, which means every millisecond if the spacecraft is doing something other than taking pictures, 
we want to minimize that as much as we can. In fact, uh, we we even uh, minimized it so that so that it would uh, not call home to us. Uh, it wouldn't tell us like, okay, I took a picture. Okay, I took a picture because that's going to take extra time. And instead, what we told it to do is we told it just to take all of its pictures, and when it's done with that, send one phone call essentially back to Earth. Uh, we called it the phone home. Um, and one signal to say it was healthy and it had done its job, and then it went back to observing. And that was about 10 minutes that we took out of its schedule. That was kind of the only, uh, the only time that we got a sense of what was going on. Uh, we got that about 8 o'clock in the evening on, on, um, on July 14th. And that was really the, that signal from the, uh, from the spacecraft is what everyone on the ground was waiting for. Wow. So, and, and how long does it take for that message to reach you? Because nine and a half years away means that that message still has to travel from point A to point B. And how long does that take? Well, fortunately, our spacecraft is traveling fast, but it's traveling a lot less than the speed of light. Uh, it only takes us about four and a half hours for, this, for the signal to reach uh, uh, from Pluto to Earth. The signal gets sent at the speed of light. Radio waves and light waves travel at the same speed. And um, so four, four and a half hours to get to us. And how do you pick up those signals? What, what are you using to detect? I mean, it must be such low frequencies to, to, or, or maybe high frequencies, or, 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 or is it the flashes of light? I mean, how are they actually sending it to you? Yeah, you can use all those methods. Um, what, you, what we're using are, are um, uh, kind of centimeter wavelengths. Uh, so it's kind of a mid-frequency. Uh, it's, it's a radio wave. And um, uh, uh, it's kind of in the radar area. So it passes through, depending on, it passes through a lot of weather, passes through clouds. Sometimes it gets blocked by rain. And we have these massive radio dishes. Um, uh, we have three of them across the, across the world. One's in Spain, one's in California, one's in Australia. They're called NASA's Deep Space Network. Uh -huh. uh, the, uh, the radio dish, which is at Hard Beast Hook, you know, outside of Pretoria, is one of, the, one of NASA's precursors to this network. Uh, that was what NASA built in South Africa to help with the Apollo missions back in the 60s. And we now have th these three larger dishes even, uh, 80 meters across, uh, which is even larger than uh, the dishes in SKA are going to be. Wow. And, and so now this, this uh, craft travels all the way to Pluto, starts taking photographs, and the photographs come back, and you guys are all giddy over what you've just seen. What did we learn from those photographs? We learned that Pluto is active and warm, and it has a lot going on on its, on its geology. Um, I expected that Pluto would be old and dead. Um, it would have a lot of craters on its surface because it would, you know, Pluto is small, and so small things cool off quickly. And if it's cooled off quickly, then it can't have any geology on it because it's, all that geology is going to get wiped away by craters hitting it, or by craters on the surface from asteroids and, and uh, uh -huh. comets hitting it. And what we find out is not that that's not the case. We have this, uh, the, the famous feature on Pluto is this heart. It's a kind of a yeah, white what is uh, that heart all about? Mm -hmm. Well, we know what that heart is. It's probably uh, basically a lake of frozen nitrogen. Uh, I say a lake of frozen nitrogen. That's because frozen nitrogen is pretty soft, and so it actually flows kind of like glaciers flow on the Earth, um, uh, like water ice glaciers flow. Mm -hmm. But this is made of nitrogen. It's probably very fresh. We don't see... Uh, very many, if any, craters on this uh, on this kind of nitrogen frozen lake at all. Uh, that lake is probably providing nitrogen, which goes into the atmosphere. Um, we see things which may be mountains of water ice uh, that could be floating on that nitrogen lake. Maybe they're kind of like little boats that get pushed around in the wind. Um, we see a huge variety of different terrain on the surface of Pluto. There's these these ice mountains. There's this this lake. There's uh, very dark regions where it looks like there's organic molecules. This doesn't mean there's life there, but it just means there are very complex molecules that have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And these are the sorts of ingredients that make up life, and it makes up a lot of the complex chemistry that we see on other planets around the solar system. Whether there's life there or not, it's probably too cold for life on Pluto but we see complex chemistry going on, much more complex than we anticipated. Wow. And, and I mean, what have we, okay, we've learned what it now looks like and, and what is, but what, what does this mean to us? Now that we know this information, what's the big deal? Well, we're shocked by it because there's 
Um, so this means that some of our models for the solar system uh, really need to be revised because uh, we don't understand this physics. Um, uh, this probably doesn't change, um, you know, some things in the solar system, it doesn't change. Like, you know, this, we're not looking for life there. It's not like we found aliens walking around the surface. Um, but our models for how the solar system formed, for how uh, the physics of small planets um, uh, and comets and asteroids probably happened throughout the solar system really have to be updated. Certainly there's been some debate about whether Pluto is a planet or not. And just from how exciting it is there, I mean, obviously Pluto is a planet. You look at all this action going on on the surface, there's, there's no question there. I think that debate is, uh, is kind of uh, over and dead now because anyone can look at this and see, like, clearly um, this thing is so much more exciting and dynamic and diverse uh, than even in some of the planets in our solar system. Like, uh, you know, you look at Mercury. Uh, there's not, there's not, Mercury's a great place, but, man, from a, from a diversity standpoint of geology, uh, Pluto Pluto has a beat uh, with any question. Wow. So when, when I first met you, you were a very big fan of Pluto and 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 quite disappointed that, that Pluto had been demoted to a, a non-planet. And, and now do you feel vindicated after all these magnificent discoveries? Well, I, I don't really care whether I'm personally right or wrong. Um, I'm excited that Pluto is an exciting place, and that and that we're seeing all of these mysteries that uh, that we don't understand. In fact, it's actually more interesting to have to have us be surprised and have our predictions for what is there be wrong rather than be right. I mean, I think we found that it looked exactly like what we thought. We would be bored, you know. So um, I'm I'm really stoked that it's uh, that it's a fabulously interesting and surprising and delightful place. Awesome, awesome. Well, I know that some of the kids might want to ask some questions, so we're going to go to, to uh, Ms. Fletcher's class. Do you guys want to unmute your mic and then maybe ask some questions? Yeah, I'm going to bring up a kid, who, a, one of my students who can ask a question, okay? Carla. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> it was a famous yesterday. Oh my <laughs> All right, Carla, what's your question? Okay, my question is, who exactly named Pluto? Ah, now can you move a little bit into the camera so we can actually see you? Otherwise, <laughs> we only got half your face. Um, who exactly named Pluto? Oh, hold on. I can hold. tell you that. Uh, who, who named? Who, who named? Who, who was Pluto named Good after? Right, have a seat. That's right. Pluto was named after, uh, there's, there's two ways I can answer that question. Uh, Pluto was discovered in 1930 by a guy named Clyde Tombaugh. He was a young astronomer, and the astronomer who had hired him to do the job was a guy named Percival Lowell. Percival Lowell died just before it was found. Um, but uh, there was a contest for, hey, what should the name of this new planet be? And there was a schoolgirl who was about 10 years old from England, and her name was Venetia Burney. And she was interested in Greek mythology, and so she, she wrote in a letter and said, I think it should be named Pluto, because Pluto is the god of the underworld. And she thought the underworld would be very cold, and Pluto is very cold, and so, so it kind of makes sense. The people at Lowell Observatory, they liked that. They thought it made sense. But they also noticed something interesting, which is Pluto has the same letters as Percival Lowell. Get it? You have the T ah. and the L there. So they could sort of honor the astronomer Percival Lowell, in that name, put their little their little uh, little reference in there, and also have a really appropriate name. So Venetia Burney is the one who named it after uh, the one who funded this discovery, uh, Percival Lowell. Wow, very cool. And then Tanya, your group want to ask a question? Go ahead, Tyler. Do you know what um, the heart is made out of? The Do you know what the heart is made out of? Yes. Yes, the heart is probably made out of nitrogen. It's like the nitrogen, which you and I and everyone breathes. Most of our air is made up of nitrogen. It's a chemical. It's a, uh, it's a gas when it's warm. And it can condense into a liquid when it's cold. And when it's really super cold, nitrogen condenses and turns into an ice. And that's what we think is on Pluto in the heart is this super, super cold nitrogen ice. It's super cold because Pluto is super far from the sun. And the further you are away from the sun, the colder and colder it gets. It's, it's, um, uh, it's about uh, 250 
my negative 250 degrees Celsius. Wow. Well, it just so happens that uh, Suresh is uh, all the way in Nepal, and he is with NASA, which is the uh, Nepalese ast astronomical something. I, I think he'll tell us a little more about that. I, I know he typed it in here somewhere. And uh, he says that the NOR game, uh, it's the Nepal Astronomical Society. Um, and he says that uh, Norgay Montes, the icy mountains on Pluto, were named after Tenzin Norgay Sherpa. So he feels that uh, that is a huge honor for, for the Nepalese people. Oh, I, I, you know, we, we, uh, that's great to hear. It's great to hear. Uh, in fact, he is correct. We do have the, the, uh, the Norgay Montes, which are named in honor of this, uh, this great Nepalese explorer. Uh, and uh, those are not the only ones either. We see mountains on uh, elsewhere in Pluto, mountains, canyons, craters, valleys, and so forth, which are named for explorers all over the country. There's some Chinese ones, uh, there's some from India, there's some from America, there's some from South America, uh, and uh, there's some from Africa. We've tried to take suggestions from all over the world for names for the features of Pluto, because this is really not just the scientists who, are, uh, who get to name these features. It's really, it's really for everybody. So, uh, and is there a uh, uh, mountain range? Is is there a throop I'm mountain? Sorry, what's the question? A throop mountain range? Uh, we've tried not to name it after ourselves. You know that would be a little bit uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, we we try to honor uh, people from the past, um, either explorers or scientists or uh, cultural icons or things like that. There are some science fiction references. I think there's a Skywalker, uh, Skywalker crater there. Um, from the uh, from the Star Wars series, there's a there's a uh, there's a, a Doctor Who reference in there, a TARDIS, um, and uh, as well as uh, many more ancient uh, names as well. But now the one question I have is, you know, you send a a, 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 a little vessel to travel for nine and a half years. How did that thing stay awake? for nine and a half years. Did you have to power it down or power it up? Was it on running on battery or solar power? Yeah, so how do we power this? That's a great question. Um, if we're running on batteries, then our batteries would run out because uh, just like you know, on your, on your phone, the batteries, they just have a, a, you know, a four hour talk time, right? And then it's, uh, then it's game over. Uh -huh. um, and uh, with, a, with, a, uh, with solar cells, that works great if you're going to the moon or if you're going to Jupiter even or Mars uh, because there's lots of sunlight from the sun. But we're so far away from the sun that we have uh, you know, about a thousand times less sunlight at Pluto than we do at the Earth. And so there's not enough, your solar cells would have to be huge to, uh, to power the spacecraft there. So instead what we use is essentially a battery made out of plutonium. Wow. Um, plutonium is a radioactive element. It gives off heat, and we take that heat, and then we convert that heat into electricity. Uh, it's not quite a battery, but it's a, it's a power source made out of plutonium. And uh, that power source runs for a long time, uh, many decades, um, and it gives us about 200 watts, which is not that much. It's about uh, you know, enough to power a computer and a couple of light bulbs. Um, but that is enough to power our spacecraft and its transmitter, sending, uh, sending all the images back to Earth. That is insane. That is insane. And uh, now that they've, they've visited, where, what's happened to New Horizons? Uh, it's, it's keeping going. It's about um, oh, maybe uh, 20 million, 30 million kilometers past, um, uh, past Pluto now. Um, it's still moving. Uh, it's, it's been about two months since the, since the, uh, since the encounter, uh -huh. uh, two and a half months. Um, and its main job right now is to send all the data back to the Earth. Now, I told you that it took four and a half hours to send, uh, to send a message to the Earth. But we have so many messages because we have so many, uh, so many images that we have to send. And so each message uh, might take three hours, four hours, five hours, or a day to send each image. We have thousands of images. We need to send them all back. It actually takes us close to a year to, uh, to downlink all of the images and all of the data and all the observations from the spacecraft back down to the ground. Wow. So uh, nearly 24-7, uh, the spacecraft is up there doing uh, telemetry back to the Earth, 
where it's just sending these, sending these images, sending these other data uh, back to the Earth. And so we are receiving new images essentially daily, um, having a great time looking at them, and still excited for the things uh, yet to come. It's not observing anymore. These are all images which is it's stored on its memory card, and it's going to be uh, uh, just sending back more and more images of Pluto from its one day of observation over the course of the next year. Okay. Well, it just so happens that uh, I've got some questions here from Suresh. Let me just uh, load it up on the screen. Um, where are we? Let's have a look. Um, oh, here we are. And I'm just going to put them in over here so that I can read them. And it says here that uh, these are from a student who is in high school. His name is Nawaj. And he wants to know, how did the spacecraft get through the asteroid belt? And then it also says here, New Horizons performed a, a gravity assist flyby of Jupiter. Was this gravity slingshot possible with other giant planets like Le Neptune uh, and Uranus before it reached Pluto, if any of these questions make sense? OK, good question. Uh, did the gravity assist one first? Um, indeed, we did. We went past Jupiter. So we got a little bit of a kick from, from Jupiter. Jupiter's gravity sped us up a little bit. Uh, and that reduced the time to, to uh, made us go faster, which means instead of taking about 12 years to go to Pluto, we were able to do it in nine years. Wow. Um, as far as going through the asteroid belt, indeed you are correct. There's the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. So we passed that before we got to Jupiter. Um, uh, we went right through the asteroid belt, and it turns out, you know, if, if, you, if you watch, uh, if you think of the asteroid belt, you might think of uh, someone driving a spacecraft, and they're like, meow, psh, meow. <laughs> you know, try to dodge the asteroids there. Um, you know, if you, if you watch the Empire Strikes Back with uh, Han Solo really piloting the, the, the spaceship there, uh, the asteroid belt isn't like that. You can be asleep and uh, put your spacecraft on autopilot, and it can cruise right through the space, right through the asteroid belt without a problem. In fact, you can do that a million times over and over again, uh, back and forth, and never run into an asteroid belt, never run into an asteroid. The asteroid belt is uh, not quite as empty as the rest of space, but it's still pretty darn empty. Uh, wow. So, so there's not too many asteroids out there. Space is big. We have, we have a lot of asteroids out there, actually, but space is big, so it's, we don't hit into them. So now... Uh, I'm sorry, and I forgot to answer that in the first question fully. Yeah. Other gravity assists with Neptune and with Uranus. Um, in theory, we could have done those, except Neptune and Uranus weren't in the right place. The Voyager spacecraft did a great flyby uh, with gravity assists of all four large planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We just used Jupiter because the other planets weren't in the right place, uh, lined up with Pluto. Okay. Um, from from Miss Fletcher's class, uh, her students want to know: Does Pluto have any moons? And how long have you been a scientist? Pluto indeed does have moons. One of them was discovered in 1976. Its name is Charon. And uh, uh, then, in the last uh, decade or so, we've discovered four more, and their names are uh, Nix and Hydra and Styx. And Kerberos. So we have five moons at, Jupiter, at, uh, at um, Pluto. And uh, they, get, they keep getting smaller and smaller. The more you look, the more moons you find. Uh, I helped discover one of those. I was on the team that discovered uh, uh, Styx. Wow. Um, and we, we discovered that using the Hubble Space Telescope. So you get a, get a, a large telescope, dark, uh, and dark, dark area to look at, and uh, it, uh, we were able to, to detect it. It's very faint. It's very small. It's about the size of... Um, uh, it's maybe 20 kilometers across, so roughly the size of Cape Town, more or less. Wow. Um, uh, it must be quite an honor to be part of, of a team that, that had discovered that. That was, that was nice to be involved with that discovery, you bet. <laughs> so now, uh, a question from Suresh in Nepal. Um, he's got a journalist that would like to know, uh, why was Pluto removed from the solar system, and what are the criteria for any space objects to be a member of the solar system? Um, so first, to clear it up, uh, Pluto was not removed from the solar system, um, uh, but there was a vote at, um, everyone agrees that Pluto is still inside the solar system. In fact, everything, whether it's a comet, whether it's an asteroid, a piece of dust, a spacecraft, if it's physically near the sun, it's inside the solar system. Um, and if it, to be outside of the solar system, you would have to go to the next star, which would be Alpha Centauri, or Proxima Centauri, uh, discovered in South Africa about 100 years ago. 
Um, and uh, uh, so there's no debate, debate that it's inside the solar system. There was some debate about whether Pluto is called a, classified as a planet or not. Uh, there, was a, there was a meeting of astronomers in 2006. Uh, this one small group of astronomers voted for a new definition of the word planet that didn't include Pluto. Um, most astronomers honestly uh, disagree with that, and most astronomers still call Pluto a planet, and certainly after New Horizons, um, I, you know, even more of them do. Uh, it, it was sort of a technical definition and a technical vote on, on uh, the, the, the characteristics of what you have to have to become a planet. Mm -hmm. um, you can read about this more on Wikipedia, but essentially they said to be a, have to be a planet, you have to be round, and you have to have um, uh, no debris going around you in space, and um, orbit the sun, and so forth. And if you read their degree, if you read their definition technically, then you know, the Earth isn't a planet, and Jupiter and Saturn aren't planets either. So it was a, it's, it's not a very well-written definition. It's very hard to define the word planet. Um, and so they did a good job trying, but they didn't really come up with a definition that's very useful or very accurate. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, do, are there any questions from uh, Ms. Smith's class? Yes, we have some questions. Hey, right, here's our first one. If Earth has a relative which some people call his, uh, the sister, then does uh, Pluto have any relative, like anything that's kind of like it? You're going to have to say that a little bit louder and a little bit slower. We, we didn't get all of that. If Earth has a relative, is there any planet that's kind of like a relative to Pluto? Ah, that's a good question. They found planets that are what they call relatives to Earth that are similar in, 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 in their makeup and, and possibly even supporting life. Does Pluto have any relatives? Ah, does Pluto have any relatives? So yes, these other planets that are like Earth, we found them, they're not in our solar system, they're in other distant solar systems, and we can see them very, very faintly with telescopes, um, but we don't really know anything about them because they're so far away, except that they might be of similar size to the Earth. Pluto probably does have a lot more relatives. Uh, Pluto is in what's called the Kuiper Belt, and the Kuiper Belt is this region of space, the region of the outer solar system, and in fact, Pluto probably has hundreds of thousands of relatives out there, which are like Pluto, maybe a little bit smaller, maybe a little bit further away, but the same basic idea as Pluto. Um, and these bodies in the, in the, sol in the Kuiper Belt, uh, what's cool about New Horizons is because it's go it went past Pluto and then it's keeping going on past it, it's actually going to, be vis going to be able to visit some of these other Kuiper Belt objects. It's going to do that, uh, we expect, in early 2019. Uh, if NASA approves our plan to go visit one of these other Kuiper Belt objects. Wow. Uh, this thing will be smaller than Pluto. It'll be, you know, instead of being uh, you know, 2,000 kilometers across, it'll be something like uh, 50 kilometers across. We have our eyes on one really nice target. So we will see things which are similar to Pluto, uh, but a little bit different. But there's also, but they're small, and they're icy, and they're cold, and so they're, in some ways, a relative of Pluto. Okay. Another question from Ms. Yeah, class? Yes. Since Pluto is a dwarf planet, uh, is it better than the other planets? Did you get that? Yeah, since Pluto is a dark planet, could you clarify what do you mean by dark? He means dwarf. Smaller. A dwarf planet? A dwarf planet. Dwarf planet. Um, you know, is it better than the other planets? Um, um, it's, every planet is different. planet is unique. And I think some things that we see that are similar between the different planets, like we have um, impact craters where the where an asteroid or a comet has carved a crater onto the surface of the planet. And other things like this big nitrogen lake we see on Pluto but we don't see anywhere else at all. So it's totally, totally different and surprising. And so it's just like people. It's just like um, you know, if you have siblings, you might say, are you better or worse than your sibling? Um, but your parents, of course, love everybody, uh, just like we love every planet in the solar system, because they're all unique. They're all special. Ooh, that was a great diplomatic answer. Um, we've got a couple of questions here from Nepal. Um, it says here from Will uh, Basial. He's a high school student as well. 
why do we know there is water in a planet which is 2,400 light years away from us and still don't know whether there is life on Mars? Why did it take us so long for us to discover water on Mars? <laughs> okay, so um, here's, the, here's the, the, the deal with Mars. Um, we have known that there's water on Mars, in fact, for many, many decades. Um, uh, we've known that there's ice in Mars' polar caps, and we've known that there's liquid water, kind of like clouds, uh, in Mars' atmosphere. I mean, not liquid water, but um, uh, gaseous water. Uh, what we haven't seen before is liquid water, which is currently on the surface. And that's because there's not very much of it. Uh, we know that there used to be a lot of liquid water on the surface of Mars, but the liquid water on the surface of Mars now is very small and very, very well hidden. And that's because as soon as it comes to the surface, it either evaporates or freezes. And so it's very, very hard to detect. And I think that these new observations do show that there is liquid water very near the surface of Mars, of Mars um, occasionally. But it's, a, it's, uh, it's not like there's a giant lake of it. It's just that there's small portions of Mars which are moist. You know, it's kind of like there might be a, a, a small, small, you know, river of mud that goes for one afternoon and then dries up, that sort of thing, um, rather than uh, a pool of water on the surface of Mars. Okay. Um, we have predicted that there's some water on distant planets. We've never really seen that water on these distant planets that are many, many light years away. But we think that these planets are at about the right temperature. You know, water's kind of unique, that, um, or water's, uh, if you're looking for where to find water, because that's most interesting if you're looking for where life is, you want a planet that's going to be at the right temperature. If your planet is too hot, the water's going to boil away. If your planet is too cold, like Pluto, the water is going to, um, to freeze. But you have to be right in the middle, right in this kind of like perfect temperature. Um, for the water to be liquid water, which is what we want if we want to be looking for life. And so we think that um, you know, Pluto's too cold for that, uh, Mercury is too hot for that, but um, the Earth and maybe some of these new planets that we're finding in other solar systems are right at that perfect temperature. Wow. So now what's next for you? I mean, you're now sitting in Mumbai. What are you doing in Mumbai? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, India has a space program, which is kind of uh, started, like, like um, South Africa, there's a lot of interest in space here. There's a lot of interest in astronomy, and they're working on building some new telescopes and uh, doing some new research programs. And so I'm working with some of those groups here. I'm continuing my work with the New Horizons spacecraft through NASA remotely, and um, uh, also just exploring the amazing country of India. Wow. And now I know that Suresh is, is based in Nepal. Is there a chance that you might get yourself out to Nepal? I'd sure love to. I, Nepal is one of those countries I'd love to visit sometime. Okay, so I'll put you in touch with Suresh because uh, he's quite involved Please. with the Astronomical Society there, and they're always looking for experts on, on spacey matters. Um, we've got time for one more question. So, Ms. Smith, does your class want to ask one, one more question? Or are they gone? Yeah, my, sorry, my class actually had to go to lunch. They gave about half of their lunch, but then they had to go for the rest. <laughs> well, I mean, oh. that was already a sacrifice in itself. <laughs> yeah, well, they needed to eat. Okay. But I well, told them I'd show them the rest of the recording. Okay, good. That's good. All right, so then, then, then Henry, I'm going to ask you one more question before we go, and, and that is uh, they've now found water on Mars, but you've said that they've known about it all along. But... What you're saying is that they've only got evidence now that there is Mars. Is that what you're saying? Um, let me clarify that. We have known that there is ice and uh, water vapor on Mars for a long, long time, many decades. And we know that that stuff is there now. What this recent result has shown is that there is liquid water also on the surface of Mars. Ah. So what does this mean? Well... If you look, the reason why we're interested in liquids is that chemistry happens much faster in liquids than it does in solids or gases. And that's why almost all life, I mean, all life is based on liquid water and liquid chemical reactions. And so if you're interested in life, uh, you're really interested in looking for liquid water. And that's what we had uh, not found before on Mars. We know that Mars used to be warm and wet and have liquid water all over the surface because we can see where these rivers used to run on the surface of Mars. By used to, what I mean is, you know, 2 billion, 3 billion years ago, 4 billion years ago. Uh -huh. um, 
And so what we now know is there's a tiny, tiny amount of water which is near the surface of Mars. Um, we don't know how it gets there. We don't know how long it lasts. But maybe it's there for a day or two before it dries up. Um, does this mean anything for life on Mars? Perhaps the answer is no. Uh, it might mean that there's just, there's just not enough there for it to be very important. Um, but we, it, it's worth investigating uh, to see where that water comes from and how long it's there. Uh, because it's possible, I mean, maybe in an extreme case, maybe this means there's a big aquifer of water beneath the surface that we want to go investigate. Maybe it just means there's a little bit of water condensing out of the atmosphere uh, onto a cool area, into the shadows, uh, in which case it's probably not very important at all. So Mars, from everything that we know, Mars is pretty dead, uh, pretty dry and dead. Uh, this may not change that picture at all, um, but we, we don't know that yet. Wow. And, I mean, Ellen Stofan, we spoke to her yesterday, and uh, she said that, you know, they were predicting to find life within the next 10 years or so. What is your gut feel? Do you think we're going to find life in the next five years? Because space travel and, and things are developing so quickly that uh, they're already having the, the, uh, the, the SpaceX, no, not SpaceX, the X Prize. To, to get uh, private people to land something on the moon. So surely we're going to have private uh, consumers building things, maybe racing to other planets and trying to discover life. You know, if you want us to discover life, don't go to Mars, because we know that maybe there's some, some liquid water in small portions of it, but there's not very much. But where you want to go is two different places. Uh, go to Europa, which is the moon of Jupiter. Go to Enceladus, which is the moon of Saturn. We know that there's liquid water and a lot of it on both those near the surface. So go there because it's liquid water, which means there's something which is warm, something which is melting the ice and making it warm. There's a lot of it, um, and it's been there for a long time. So go to one of those places and look for life there. And I think if we do, uh, then you might find something pretty interesting. And, and now New Horizons is just carrying on and could probably carry on for another 200 years with its power supply. What are the chances that it's going to continue taking photographs of things that it passes way beyond Pluto, and we start getting photographs of things that we have never seen before? Yeah, we um, right now we have a, a one flyby of a Kuiper Belt object scheduled for early uh, January 2019. Um, we can uh, we have enough fuel and enough batteries or power to fly by a couple of other Kuiper Belt objects, maybe two, maybe three more, something like that. Um, and if we just go in a straight line, the space is empty, so if we just go in a straight line, we're not going to run into anything just, just at random. Um, uh, but uh, So we do need to use fuel to sort of turn in the right direction um, uh -huh. to, to do a flyby or something. And it has to be targeted. Uh, but you know, we expect to really be able to explore, even if we can just explore two or three more objects, um, that's going to give us insight into the diversity of bodies in the Kuiper Belt. And man, you look at how much we found at Pluto. Uh, it's going to be thrilling to see what, what we can at some of these other bodies as well. Well, if, if it's going to take a year to receive all the data, do you think that the new information that arrives over the next couple of months might surprise you? Of course it's going to surprise us. We keep getting surprised. I mean, we're, 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 not, we're not bored. We're not just uh, turn the computer off. It's all, it's all solved. You know, um, Give up and go to Saturn instead. No, it's, uh, it's, we're getting amazing pictures every day. And it's all high res. Uh, well, some of it is. Some of it. Uh, we're actually getting better and better resolution as it as it um, goes along, and that's because the first images that we sent down were actually low resolution. Uh, that's because we wanted to make sure that we got these images down as fast as we could uh -huh. in case something happened to the spacecraft. Correct. And so our highest priority images, we compressed them, so meaning they were pretty low quality, and uh, and we um, and we sent them down as. Uh, um, Essentially, in a camera, you would send it down as a JPEG image okay. rather than a raw image. Yeah. And uh, and we do those quickly. And um, uh, now we're sending down essentially the raw images so we can get the full data from the uh, from, from the science. And uh, so we're getting down higher resolution data uh, uh, as we go along. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. Well, I know that you've got to go, and and we've got to go, and we appreciate the fact that despite all the technical hitches, we still managed to get you on board. You know, this is what it's all about: problem solving at its finest. 
And I'm so pleased that we were able to connect with you and find out more about Pluto. And of course, I know if Suresh is, and if any of the students that he's working with, the high school students, if they are keen to find out more about it, uh, they can just email me and I'll pass on the questions to you. Um, but thank you so much for making uh, the time to, to speak with us. I don't know if you can see me. You probably can't see me. You can't see me, and, and they can't see me because I'm sharing you on the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the share screening, screen sharing, so then they can see me, but they can't see you. And I'm just going to say thank you very much, and uh, we wish you all the best of luck in Mumbai. And keep taking those lovely photographs, because those photographs are absolutely fantastic. You love to see the things that you come up with. Uh, you look like you're taking part in, in all the various festivals and, and all the exciting <laughs> events that are happening there. And, and while we are very envious, because we have some good friends in India that would love to connect with you as well, um, we're hoping that maybe you'll make a trip back to South Africa at some point. Are there any plans? I look forward to it at some point. Just the, uh, yeah, I really do miss South Africa a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a great country, and I was so happy to be there for uh, for a couple of years. And um, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, it's terrific to um, place to be doing astronomy. People are, are amazing, as you as you see from from uh, your photos uh, and <laughs> what you're doing, and what's done in Cape Town, and and uh, so thank you all. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for calling in and bearing with. Uh, Bearing with uh, the, the, the issues here. Um, thanks for your good questions, and uh, thank you all. Wonderful, and we'll keep in touch. All right. Thanks okay. a lot, Henry. Bye bye. Good night.